Well, welcome everybody. We're really excited about this talk today and I'm really pleased to welcome Professor John Baugh um, to, give this, um, to give this talk. He is the Margaret Bush Wilson Professor in Arts and Sciences at Washington University in St. Louis. He's a professor of psychology, anthropology, education, English, linguistics, and African American studies. Um, and you'll see how all those things intersect today as his, um, during his talk. He directs the African and African American Studies program, and the program is collaborative and interdisciplinary, and it involves scholars from, and students from across Washington University who work to advance teaching, scholarship, and public service throughout the African diaspora. I always like to think about why somebody's research or why this kind of research in particular is, is important, what we need to pay attention to. And, and I think about how his work um, looks at the intersection between linguistic behavior and social stratification. So looking at language behavior in context is really important because language is how we communicate, how we learn, how we interact. And it's also the basis um, for how we make assumptions and judgments about people. So his interest, John's interest began um, in this area with quantitative and experimental studies of linguistic variation among African Americans. Um, and these studies evolved into applied linguistic research on linguistic discrimination that has um, um, implications for policy issues in medicine, in education, and in law. Um, more recently, he's expanded this work to include populations who um, endure or suffer um, linguistic discrimination, including deaf communities, people who speak languages other than English, people who have accents, people who are bilingual, people who use different varieties and dialects of English. And so um, with that, I um, want to very warmly welcome um, Professor John Baugh. His talk today is called Black and Brown Voices Matter. Thank you very much, Liz. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully everybody will be able to um, see my slide presentation. So by coincidence of timing, it's Indigenous Peoples Day and um, wonderfully appropriate for this talk. When I received this invitation originally, I was asked to provide um, a presentation that would be complementary to the upcoming uh, airing of the documentary produced by Walt Wolfram, um, um, uh, Talking Black in America. And when I thought about that and realized that we're living in a moment where a great deal of public emphasis is on Black lives and how Black lives matter, um, as a slave descendant myself, I did not want to ignore some of the other populations that also suffer from linguistic discrimination. And so um, with the kindness of the hosts, they allowed me to expand beyond the African-American population and hence the title Black and Brown Voices Matter. And so today I'll be talking a lot about um, the linguistic history of the United States and many of the issues that I believe are um, important for us to understand, to have a full appreciation of the rich linguistic diversity that's part of our national heritage. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging my sponsors. Uh, I have the Ford Foundation listed in bold print at the top because throughout my career, the Ford Foundation has been the most generous of all foundations. Um, they provided money that allowed me to attend graduate school when I showed very little promise whatsoever. They took a great deal of risk on me and they were kind enough to fund 10 years of my research on linguistic profiling five years initially in the United States, looking at linguistic discrimination in housing, employment, and in education, and then another five years allowing me to look at 
linguistic discrimination in other parts of the world, including the Caribbean. Um, Rio de Janeiro was my primary research site in Brazil. Cape Town was my primary research site in South Africa. Paris was my primary research site in France. And then London was where I was based when I was looking at these linguistic discrimination issues in, uh, in England. Um, and uh, as you heard me mention most of those places, um, it's, it's purely a coincidence that the majority of them are absolutely wonderful places to take a vacation. Um, so National Science Foundation and others. Um, down at the bottom, you'll notice that I mentioned St. Mark Presbyterian Church in Newport Beach. Uh, I know that some of the viewers today are affiliated with St. Mark Church, and I'm grateful to have this opportunity to speak with you. Um, some of you had an opportunity to hear my mother talk about issues of linguistic diversity, and so um, I, I can't keep up with her, but I'll do my best to uh, you know, maintain uh, the family reputation here. So, but I want to start by um, saying a little bit of something, giving some shout outs to my uh, friends at UCI. And I'm going from left to right in the order of how long I've known them. Um, so Professor Pena was kind enough to introduce me. But for those of you that don't know Liz or her research, She's one of the premier scholars in speech pathology that looks at um, bilingual populations and native Spanish speakers primarily. And we met probably over 20 years ago when we were working on a collaborative venture to come up with new speech, di speech pathology diagnostics for uh, people who were not native speakers of English and focusing primarily on Spanish speakers. And it was in that context, uh, I was an undergraduate major in speech and communication at Temple University. Liz got her PhD at Temple University in speech pathology. So we shared that Philadelphia connection. Um, we both spent some time, not at the same time, teaching at the University of Texas at Austin and our paths crossed at different uh, conferences through the years. She's a fellow of the American Speech Pathology Association and um, quite exceptional in the field. So anyone who has an interest in speech pathology and bilingual populations, you should look her up. Uh, the next photo is of the late Professor jo Joseph L. White. Joe White was a professor of psychology at UC Irvine for decades. I met Joe through a family connection. Joe's daughter, Lori, got her PhD in education, educational leadership at Stanford University at a time when I was on the faculty there and I was a member of her dissertation committee. Um, I knew of her father's work for many years before them. He's one of the leading figures in the, and he was in, one of the founding members of the Association of Black Psychology and did a tremendous job in really pointing out some of the ways in which the field of psychology had not adequately served African-American populations. And Joe died probably about a year ago. But prior to that, I think he was at UCI for nearly 30 years. Um, next to that is the Dean of Social Science, uh, Bill Maurer. And Bill is um, quite a heavy hitter in the field of social science. He's, he's the Dean there for good reason. And uh, he, he's actually as young as he appears to be in that photo. He's an anthropologist who works on finance. It, uh, Bill's uh, skills in some ways are frightening. He, he brings together areas of research that are not usually expected. So as a cultural anthropologist who studies the, the world of finance, he's actually served as a consultant to various agencies throughout the world looking at changing economic circumstances, 
and different econ uh, economic systems, uh, cyber currencies, and other things along those lines. And, and we serve on a committee together for the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, it's the Board on Behavioral and Cognitive and Sensory Sciences. And uh, it's been my pleasure to work with Bill in, in, on that board for a few years. And I, I know least well, but am very impressed with Professor Gregory Contras. Greg uh, is famous in linguistics for his work on cognitive uh, linguistics. He, he's uh, an expert on how language is processed in the brain, primarily looking at semantic categories. And he uh, got his PhD at Harvard University, was a research fellow at Stanford University, and is one of the up and coming stars in theoretical linguistics, especially as it relates to the field of semantics. So I am delighted to you know, give a shout out to all of them. They're extraordinary folks and I'm honored that uh, they've invited me to share my research with you today. But in so doing, I wanna pay tribute to my parents. This presentation is dedicated to my mom and dad. The photo on the left is my mom's high school prom. Uh, whenever I share this picture, she wants everybody to know that her mother made that dress. And um, long before, um, back when the, the Cosby show was something that uh, people admired, uh, our family could have been the cast for that. You see us on the right. Um, that's my parents, my younger brother, Kevin, my younger sister, my youngest sister, Sherry. There's a 10 year difference between Kevin and I and a 12 year difference between Sherry and I. And uh, uh, I wanted you to see uh, my uh, fashion statement with the white socks. My favorite photo of my parents is this one. Um, I, I'm blessed. Uh, both my parents have PhDs, always emphasized education, and they've been my strongest supporters throughout my career. So I know my mom is watching this and mom, you know, I love you and I'm, you know, proud that uh, you're able to be with us to share this. So many of you have already seen the abstract. I'm going to be concentrating in large measure on the linguistic legacy of the African slave trade, but I'll also be talking about some other uh, populations and specifically uh, the concept of talking while bilingual, which was promoted by my former colleague, Ana Celia Zentea, who's Professor Emerita of Education and Ethnic Studies at UC San Diego. And um, I will not be concentrating that much on the legal issues. If they come up in the question and answer period, uh, we can talk about them more then. But before I begin, I realize that many people watching this lecture may not know a lot about linguistics or what our science is. And the briefest explanation I can provide to describe linguistics is it's the science, the social science, that tries to determine what all human languages have in common. Even though they're un mutually unintelligible, they have to share certain features in order to function as a human language. And this also includes sign language. Even though sign language is not spoken, it contains many of the elements that we find in spoken languages. Now, what you see in red is the phonetic transcription for the English that's written above. And linguists utilize the international phonetic alphabet to write down what people actually say. And so what you see down below is the phonetic transcription for what is linguistics. And that uh, the international phonetic alphabet is a very useful tool for linguists for example, if we ever encounter a language that's not already written, thanks to the International Phonetic Alphabet, we can create an alphabet for that language and can bring literacy to any group of people um, that may have an oral tradition but don't yet have a, a written one. 
So again, for my purposes, it's good to think of linguistics as the science that tries to determine what all human languages have in common. Before we proceed, though, I want to uh, share a disclaimer. Um, some of the images that I'll be sharing um, in some ways are troubling. Uh, they reflect circumstances in the nation's past that don't necessarily present our nation in its most favorable light, but I think represent honest portrayals of historical circumstances. So I wanted you to be aware of this in advance. Um, some of what I will be sharing um, is troubling, but nevertheless important to the information I hope to share. So when we go back in time, um, the first contact between the indigenous people that we celebrate today and the colonizers was the result of, um, let me go back for a second. This, this was the result of advances in technology and prior to colonization, um, this is what the linguistic landscape looked at between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. If you look closely on your screen at the areas that occupy New Mexico and Arizona today, you see Navajo and Apache uh, up where, uh, you know, Michi Michigan is, you see Potawatomi, uh, Illinois, which is actually a Native American language, uh, Wichita, Wichita, Kansas is called Wichita because of its indigenous roots. And uh, you can see Chickasaw down near Mississippi. And you, you know, if you look at all of these um, different indigenous languages, they've been reduced as a direct result of colonization and westward expansion. And that was brought about by advances in technology in Europe so depicted in the upper right hand are, are workers, uh, not just shipbuilders, but what you see are uh, advances in tool making and technology that allowed for the building of the ships that could bring uh, uh, explorers across the ocean uh, as part of the colonization process. And of course, the advanced weaponry that they had had a great deal to do with the fact that they could uh, force their will on populations that they contacted. And so what we see with the initial 13 colonies is the beginning of the displacement of the Native American languages that we looked at uh, in the map of the continental US before colonization. And it's important to appreciate, as we will see later, that these first 13 colonies represent very different dialect regions because they were settled prior to the Industrial Revolution, right? And um, also, in addition to colonization that was, was uh, um, uh, uh, put forward by native speakers of English, you also had colonization in other parts of the region throughout North and South America that were um, uh, promoted by Spanish explorers, French explorers, and Portuguese explorers, as well as the Dutch. And so what we're seeing in this slide uh, is important to really understanding why the dialect in Massachusetts differs from the dialect in Virginia. The settlers who went to Massachusetts came from the Plymouth Dartmouth area that you see here on the southwest of England. And their dialect was really quite different from the dialect that you see in London. And the settlers that went to Jamestown came from the London area. So the initial dialect differences that you see in the United States are really the fact, are, are, are the product of the fact that the dialects that existed in England prior to the Atlantic crossing sounded quite different. 
And so this is the route that was taken by the settlers that moved to Jamestown. First, they went to the Canary Islands, provisioned there, and then on to Jamestown, at which point we begin to see uh, the growth and the initial foothold of the English language in the colonies, and of course, the emergence of our iconic founding leaders. Uh, uh, our first three presidents are still listed here, uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Quincy Adams, um, uh, Benjamin Franklin is pictured here. I shamelessly want to plug my alma mater. Uh, the University of Pennsylvania, where I got my graduate degree, was founded by Franklin. And I didn't want to forget Martha Washington. And then, you know, men obviously need the support of their wives and women for a nation to grow. And she represents, at least in this photo, uh, some of the elite populations that were supporting the men from that iconic era. As I talk today, I'd like you all to think about your own linguistic ancestry and that of your families. The vast majority of Americans trace their ancestry to people who came to the US speaking a language other than English. And one of the questions that I want you to be thinking about is whether or not you still know the heritage language of your ancestors. If you don't, that's actually the common practice for most American families. The United States is a country that does not have an official language. It's to your benefit to speak English. But unlike Germany, unlike France, uh, unlike Spain, English is not the official language within the United States. It's the dominant language, but as a nation of immigrants, we've never had an official language. And typically, when a family came to the United States of their own volition, it, it took about three generations for them to make the transition from whatever the heritage language was to English. That first generation, did their best to learn English. They typically spoke it with a very strong accent reflecting their heritage language. Their children were often bilingual, speaking English and the heritage language with their parents and grandparents at home. And by the third generation, the families would typically make the transition to English. So again, even though I may be talking for the rest of the talk about populations that don't reflect your personal linguistic heritage. It's beneficial if you keep your own family linguistic heritage in mind as I talk about the other groups. Um, again, we're a nation of immigrants and as a result of that, the populations that uh, occupy the United States today have taken different cultural and linguistic journeys to get to our country at different points in history. And our country was founded on a lot of geographic expansion that resulted from important conflicts. So the picture in the upper left is one of the iconic representations of the Revolutionary War against the British. Next to that is Custer's Last Stand at the Little Bighorn. Next to that in the upper right hand corner is the Civil War, which was you know, tremendously disruptive. Uh, whether or not the Union would be preserved uh, was a product of that war. Right below that is Andrew Jackson and the Battle of New Orleans, where we were fighting against the French and flipping across the regional maps uh, represented of the US is a picture of uh, Theodore Roosevelt and the Rough Riders from their time in Cuba. Uh, the point that is being made by these illustrations is that territorial expansion and the preservation of the Union were the result of warring factions and eventual victories on the part of the United States. And prior to that, so, so I'm, I'm sharing these maps because I want everybody to be reminded of the fact that, you know, Canada, 
is a, 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 is a country with two official languages side by side. The French settlement and the English settlement of Canada resulted in bilingual coexistence where there are two official languages, even though the United States was settled by immigrants that came from around the world, English became the dominant language. And then of course, Mexico, Spanish became the dominant language. And that's prior to um, thinking about the circumstances regarding slavery and the linguistic legacy of slavery. So this map shows where the slaves came from in Africa and where they were distributed to throughout North and South America. And the majority of African slaves were taken to Brazil. By comparison to Brazil, the number of slaves that actually came to the United States is relatively small. But slavery existed throughout North and South America and the slave trade was quite lucrative. And in fact, the Dutch slave traders referred to this trade as the gold triangle. And what would happen is the Dutch slave traders would leave Holland and the Netherlands, go to the west coast of Africa where they would pick up enslaved people from there, they would go to the New World and sell the slaves. And then they would get tobacco, spices, sugar, cotton, and other things, and then take that back to Holland. And it was extremely lucrative. And um, many important fortunes were made as a result of the slave trade. And it's important not to lose sight of that fact. The slaves were housed under in horrible conditions. But one of the facts that's not well known is that whenever possible, the slave traders would separate slaves by language in the, on, in the slave factories on the west coast of Africa. And the reason that this was done was to try to reduce the likelihood of slave revolts and slave uprisings. And it doesn't take, uh, if you think about this for a second, you realize that if you put people together that speak the same language, their communication is not going to be disrupted and the likelihood of them trying to uh, organize a revolt is much greater than if you can mix together people that don't speak the same language, thereby limiting their communication. And so that initial separation by language is unique in comparison to every other group that came to the United States of their own volition. And we're still living with those linguistic consequences today. It's not well known, but it's a factor that belies the stereotype that African-American dialect is the result of just laziness or less intelligence. And so, um, when Africans came here, they were sold into slavery. If you think about the linguistic circumstances that are implied by this picture, the people being sold would be speaking African languages. They don't yet know English. Uh, and those who are, are selling the slaves will speak English and possibly other languages. But this, um, depiction implies something that's a fallacy. You'll notice that on this particular sales block, there's a man, a woman, and a child. The implication is that they'll be sold together. The reality is they might not be. Any mother watching my presentation right now, imagine if you would be separated from any of your children because they were sold into slavery. Anyone that wants to say or believe that slavery was not the cruelest of institutions hasn't reflected on the fact that I just shared with you. <laughs>
and slavery was horrible, but in addition to being horrible, it did have important linguistic consequences. The Ebonics controversy is greatly misunderstood. Many of you who are watching this presentation may recall that in 1996, the Oakland School District declared that Ebonics was the official language spoken by the majority of African American students who attended that school district. But the term Ebonics really looks at the linguistic consequences of slavery internationally, not just in the United States. Many people who have heard the term Ebonics believe that it's synonymous with what we linguists call African American vernacular English, but that's not the case. Ebonics was coined by an African American psychologist named Robert Williams, and he combined the terms ebony for black with phonics. But I want to point out what's on the slide here. Ebonics in Brazil was primarily in contact with Portuguese. Ebonics in Haiti was primarily in contact with French, while Ebonics in the Dominican Republic was primarily in contact with Spanish and Ebonics in Jamaica in contact with English. So Ebonics really does, it's a, it's a term that uh, has international implications that far exceeds the United States. And when we focus on the linguistic circumstances related to Ebonics or African-American vernacular English, it's important to appreciate that not only were the original slaves that were captured on the west coast of Africa separated by language, but once they came to the United States, it was illegal to teach them to read and write. And so that legacy of denial of educational opportunity, which was statutory, um, prevented slaves from being exposed to the majority language. So where did the slaves learn lang the language? Well, for the most part, they were exposed to the language of white indentured servants who served as slave overseers in the fields. And they were from Scotland and Ireland and spoke with a strong brogue and would say things like, the bucket done be over yonder. Well, if you take the bucket done be over yonder and you add African phonology, you get a sentence like the bucket done be over yonder. And you can hear that in the South today. Uh, the schools that were finally provided for slave descendants in the South were overcrowded, underfunded, and, and represented bifurcated educational opportunities that were never intended to allow African Americans to be competitive with whites. Until 1954 and the Supreme Court ruling that said that it was no longer uh, allowable to segregate schools based on race. However, the phrasing that was used in that ruling that states needed to get rid of segregated schools through with all deliberate speed was somewhat vacuous because all deliberate speed is not a date certain. All deliberate speed gives tremendous flexibility to each state and states began to impose different mechanisms. And in fact, you know, most of you know that today the United States is still heavily segregated, uh, not only residentially, but also in our schools. So we have a far way to go before we overcome the legacy of racial discrimination in American schools. When we look at linguistic diversity among African Americans, however, over time, we actually see a diversity of linguistic behavior between non-standard African American usage as well as standard English. And for the most part, this depends on the interactional network of the individual. If an African American primarily lives, works, and plays, that is their occupational, domestic, and recreational interactions 
are for the most part with other African Americans, they're likely to be in quadrant number three and speak something that sounds very much like the non-standard vernacular that most of us are familiar with. But as you move further to the right, let's say you um, work with a standard English population, but you still live and play, you're in quadrant number two, your exposure to standard English is greater and the likelihood that you will speak standard English will increase as well. And to a certain extent, this diagram actually, actually represents my own linguistic journey to standard English. Um, when I was born in Brooklyn, we lived in a very poor neighborhood. Eventually we moved to Los Angeles. We lived in a, an integrated neighborhood. We eventually moved to the San Fernando Valley. Uh, by the time I went to college, my parents moved to a very exclusive neighborhood uh, called uh, Westlake Village. It's, it's out near Thousand Oaks. Um, those of you who are old enough to remember the TV show Father Knows Best or Marcus Welby, um, Robert Young was their neighbor, right? So my parents lived next door to a very famous Hollywood actor. And by the time I was a professor living on the Stanford University campus, uh, I was in the zero category. I both lived, worked, and played. You know, for heaven's sakes, I took up tennis. Um, you know, uh, most of my neighbors were professors at Stanford University. There's a section of the campus that's faculty housing. You have to be a member of the faculty to live there. But what you see here is a linguistic continuum. And just because a person is African American doesn't predetermine their linguistic background. So this is where the black population can be found based on the 2000 census, still heavily populated in the South, but also in many of the urban areas throughout the United States. When we look at the development of the United States as a country linguistically, it's important to recognize that after the first 13 colonies were established on the East Coast, advances in technology and the invention of the steam engine in particular transformed the way in which we moved from one place to another. The covered wagons that were used to take populations from the East Coast to the West uh, expanded the dialect regions as we moved further west. Down on the bottom right, you see a Pony Express rider that provided opportunities for our mail to move more quickly from one region to another. And some used sailing vessels to go around the uh, Cape uh, in South America to get to the west coast rather than take the Conestoga wagons across country. And so when we think about the territorial expansion of the United States, it's important to recognize that the early development up to the Mississippi River prior to 1803 was primarily influenced by English, but certainly not exclusively so. Immigrants were coming from many different regions. The Louisiana Territory, which became the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, was strongly influenced by the French and the green territory to the west was strongly influenced by the Spanish. So some iconic uh, historical events in the US with profound linguistic consequences, the Louisiana Purchase from France by Thomas Jefferson in 1803. In 1831, uh, President Andrew Jackson wanted the uh, land that was occupied by the Cherokee Indians in North Carolina and he sent the vast majority of that population to Oklahoma in what is infamously known as the Trail of Tears because of the number of people that died on that horrific journey. Shortly thereafter in 1836 Tennessee volunteers were involved in the Battle of the Alamo for Texas the Lone Star State, and in 1849, everybody watching this knows that gold was discovered in California. And so 
there was a great deal of motivation for people to move from one location to another, depending upon what their circumstances were, where they lived, and possible better economic opportunities in other locations. And so in 1862, we're seeing this westward expansion and the land that's occupied by indigenous populations is greatly reduced. Nearly, nearly a billion acres of what was once Indian land is now occupied by others by 18, 1862. And this is just before the nation has this disruptive experience of the Civil War. Uh, around uh, 1819 is what's depicted here. And the Spanish colonizers did an extraordinary job. When you look at the amount of territory that was occupied by Spanish settlements in comparison to the United States along this same period, it's far more extensive, right? Uh, I had no idea until I was making this presentation that Texas was once called the New Philippines. So, you know, this was news to me. But you can see this for yourself. The important point is to appreciate that the colonization resulted in English, French, and Spanish um, competing for different reasons. Um, I use these wanted posters to emphasize two different dimensions of linguistic threats as well as perceptions of criminalization affecting two different brown populations that live within the United States. On the left, you see the rewards for Sitting Bull and Geronimo, um, wanted dead or alive, taken to your first US Marshal. And then on the right, you see a reward poster for Pancho Villa, who was considered to be a bandit. Um, what these posters illustrate, at least to me, was that through the expanse, westward expansion of the United States, and the perception that the indigenous populations were enemies of the growing nation, these warring factions um, resulted not only in tremendous turmoil, but also in the um, reduction of indigenous populations and their languages in ways that had tremendous consequences. And on the other side, when you're looking at the plight affecting Spanish speakers who were once living in Mexico and then moving to other regions, the bandits that were uh, in opposition to the United States were fighting for what they believed was their own freedom. So um, the eyes of who's a bandit and who's a hero is very much depends on your perspective on whether you are you know, an indigenous population that's trying to survive or whether you feel that your land has been encroached on in other ways. I'm about to share um, uh, two commercials that look at depictions of Native Americans and Mexican Americans that are not um, free of problems Although the first one is well intended and I'll say more about it after you watch it. Some people have a deep, abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country. And some people don't. People start pollution. People can stop it. Write for Pollution Booklet, Box 1771, Radio City Station, 
So the Keep America Beautiful ad, which um, was one of the most influential when it was produced, um, tries in its own way to celebrate the heritage of Native Americans. And the actor who is depicted there um, used the stage name Iron Eyes Cody. And for many, many years, he told people that he was in fact a Native American, um, but he's actually Italian. And so he benefited greatly from playing Native Americans in many movies. His very first appearance was with a movie, a comedy made by Bob Hope called The Pale Face in 1948. And after that, uh, he did his best to try to convey to anyone who would believe him that he was in fact Native American. And his most lucrative acting roles came as a result of that. Um, some of you will recognize the next commercial. You may not believe this, but my name is Granny Goose. What's the bad goose? Well, me, eh? My Granny Goose potato chips. Unusually good. Interesting. Well seasoned. Provocative. I make them for grown ups. Now, the only question is are you grown up enough for Granny Goose? <laughs> Uh, just one or two stereotypes uh, illustrated in that commercial. Um, but the fact of the matter is, when we think about immigrant groups that have come to the United States, their depiction and treatment varies tremendously depending upon the circumstances that they faced. Uh, I began the talk talking about black and brown voices matter. But the fact of the matter is, is that all groups that have come to the United States of their own volition have contributed in one way or another. The picture in the upper right shows Chinese railroad workers that were working primarily from the Pacific out to the Rockies. And anyone who remembers the iconic picture of the two trains coming together to meet once the Continental railroad tracks were finished. We'll also remember that there are no Chinese in that photo. And that was intentional. It was racist. It was unfortunate because it was the Chinese workers that had the most dangerous jobs when the railroads were built. And but for the Chinese workers, we would not have had the rail lines built across the country. And so what you're seeing here and the horrible treatment that's depicted in the larger you know, cartoon uh, is indicative of the maltreatment that many Chinese immigrants suffered, as well as the, not only the stereotype of the Chinese laundry, but the hard work associated with completing, you know, with, with doing people's laundry and having that be the toehold into the American dream. In some ways it was quite extraordinary, but I didn't want to move on without at least sharing the discrimination against the Chinese as well as the Japanese. Many of you know, especially in California, that during World War II, the Japanese were interned and you're seeing here instructions given to Japanese families. In the lower right, a family boarding a train that's gonna take them to one of the internment camps. The unfortunate circumstances where a family is tagged to make sure that no one is lost before this journey. It's, it's more than unfortunate. It was exceedingly racist. Uh, we were at war with Germany and there were no internment camps for Germans. And so 
one can only conclude that it's the fact that this is a non-white population that's re relatively easily identified to say nothing of the fact that Japanese businesses were taken from them, Japanese homes, Japanese property. And when my family moved from Philadelphia to Los Angeles, we moved to a multiracial neighborhood where many of my neighbors were either Japanese Americans or Chinese Americans. I, I soon learned to, that I needed to take off my shoes before I went into their homes. And I was lucky to be befriended by these families. But I can tell you that they shared many stories of bitterness for the unfairness of having been treated in this way. And the linguistic consequences of this are also quite profound. So I wanna end, if I can, on a little bit happier note. Some of you may have seen this documentary, Do You Speak American? Uh, it was produced by the public broadcasting system. I was one of the associate producers for this particular film. And um, it emphasizes the fact that when it says, do you speak American? It's pointing out that yes, even though many of us speak English, the variety of English that we speak is very dissimilar from those who live in England. And so how are American dialects depicted? We talk to one another defines who we are. Damn. And American English is as rich, diverse, and lively as Americans themselves. <laughs> From north to south. <laughs> east to west. I say like Mike and do every other word. <laughs> We love to talk. Is there somebody else that I could talk to? Yeah. Dish. And chew the fat. It's not a fur piece of rabbit. It's clear that you are what you speak. Isn't this not in my vocabulary? The word is hate. So butter my butt and call me a biscuit. And sit tight as we answer the burning question. Do you speak American? And so this film um, tries to celebrate the fact that we come from different backgrounds, but we're all one people. And so I'd like to close by sharing my hope that those who have watched this call can be part of an effort to reunite the states of America and to my host at UC Irvine, thank you for making this possible. Um, to those of you that live at Regents Point with my mom, um, you know, well done. It's a wonderful place. I'll see you guys after coronavirus is no longer preventing family members like me from coming to uh, visit. And to those that are uh, members of St. Mark Presbyterian Church where my mom is a member, you know, thank you for joining me. Um, you've got an extraordinary congregation. As I said, I watched the uh, Zoom call on my mom's video diversity presentation, and it's been an honor to be with all of you. So thank you for your time, and I'll look forward to your questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that talk. Uh, if, for those of you who have questions in the audience, again, please feel free to type them in using the Q&A function, and we'll be reading out the questions live. Um, one question that we got was, uh, Professor Ba, what's your perspective on standard as a term vis-a-vis -vis calling these versions white English? From both a political and theoretical perspective, calling somebody standard when the US doesn't have a governing body of language, like for example, Spain or France, can be problem problematized. So this is a question from Andrew. All right. So that's a great question. And the use of standard is a, a moving target. So when linguists first began to refer to African American English, uh, in the 1930s, they called it substandard. Uh, 
and then eventually called it non-standard and then non-standard in Negro English. And so standard always stood in contrast to non-standard. Um, but standard for a linguist is not intended to imply uh, superiority or uh, being better than other dialects. Um, standard for some people is a preferred term as opposed to majority dialect or dominant dialect. And um, in my career as a linguist, I've seen that there's kind of a semantic drift that takes place. Um, there's a wonderful book called uh, English with an Accent by a linguist named Rosina Lippi Green. And in that book, she uses the term mainstream United States English uh, as opposed to standard English. But in an ensuing edition, she actually reverts back to the term standard uh, because she, she said that saying that something is mainstream uh, was equally problematic. And so when we're looking at this, um, well-educated people in different parts of the United States tend to speak one of two varieties. I'm trying to speak what people think of as the national standard, which is often called broadcast speech. But in Congress, you see many examples of well-educated people that speak their regional varieties. And so Senator Lindsey Graham sounds very much like a well-educated person from South Carolina. Um, the former Senator Ted Kennedy sounded like a well-educated person from Boston. And LBJ, and the second president, Bush, spoke like well-educated Texans. The first president, Bush, sounded like someone from Connecticut. So we have a juxtaposition between regional dialects uh, that are standard, but reflecting their regional pronunciation and the national standard. And it's a great question. It's, it's a problem, but we haven't figured out uh, a sufficiently neutral term to characterize this. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I wanna ask if my co-panelists have any questions that they'd like to pose while uh, the audience is working on typing in theirs. I wanna put you guys on the spot. If the answer is no, that's okay. <laughs> okay, well, I have a question. So I think you, you did a nice job of presenting us with the history of some aspects of linguistic diversity in, in North America, in the United States. Um, one thing that comes to mind, though, is that this diversity can often serve as an obstacle to opportunity. And uh, I'm wondering whether there is any sort of positive upshot toward, first of all, identifying those obstacles and then addressing them. Uh, on the basis of this linguistic diversity. So Greg, uh, say more about what you mean. I think I know what you mean, but I'd like you to- it, Okay, you know, sure. Every, every so, once in a while I can tell when someone asks the question that they actually have an answer in mind themselves. And <laughs> I, I know well, your background, so you're fairly well qualified to talk about this. So share your opinion first, and then I'll say more about it. Yeah, so, you know, I grew up in Maine, and uh, for many of us in Maine, hearing Lindsey Graham's accent, you might not recognize that, for example, he's a well-educated person from the South. You know, there are certain stigmatized dialects within the United States, and I think that stigma can uh, interact with biases and uh, lead gatekeepers to not let people in if they perceive some sort of otherness that might identify, I don't know, a lack of education, a lack of intelligence, a lack of motivation, a lack of whatever it might be. And as, as you started with, you know, language is such a good identifier of who we are. It's there in the bones of this country, um, but sometimes I think it can get in the way of opportunity. Um, I think probably the answer is going to be more education, but maybe there are some concrete policy 
proposals that could also be okay. advanced. Well, first, thank you for sharing that illustration. So I often ask my students to go through a thought experiment. And the thought experiment is one where we pretend that um, there's no racial diversity in the United States and that all of the immigration came from Europe such that everyone living in the United States is white. In other words, there were no Indians when Columbus came, slavery didn't happen, the Chinese weren't imported to build the railroads, everybody's white, okay? And then my question is, will there be linguistic discrimination in that all white United States? And the answer is yes, right? And it's often based on education, region, class, and other things, right? So the example that you gave of the perception that a, an educated white Southerner might not be perceived as being well-educated has to do with regional prejudice and a lack of you know, familiarity with the true linguistic circumstances. But if you wanna be an attorney in South Carolina, it doesn't hurt to speak the local dialect, right? That dialect might not serve you well if you are called upon to uh, work on a trial in Chicago, but back in South Carolina, it will do just fine, right? So the nature of linguistic discrimination varies tremendously depending upon what the gatekeeper finds objectionable, right? And the research that we've done on linguistic profiling shows, for example, we did, we did an experiment that um, where um, people were encouraged to call about um, a, a position at a bank for executive vice president of, you know, some finance wing. And we discovered that women who called for this position were told that the job was unavailable whereas men who called for the position were given more information, right? So whoever was screening that had a clear bias in favor of men and against women. Um, I don't know how much education, you know, one needs to share in order to overcome that degree of prejudice. And so in my experience, it's usually a two-edged sword. Uh, Professor Pena will know well that there are many people who sell services on accent reduction to immigrants, right? Lose your accent. And actually what they're trying to can sell is that they can replace your accent. But the fact of the matter is, if Arnold Schwarzenegger can be governor of California and Henry Kissinger can be secretary of state, then accent reduction or elimination should only go so far, right? And acceptance of people who speak with an accent needs to be on the rise. And so my message is that, you know, to people who have bit experienced linguistic discrimination, you know, I try to be sympathetic and understand. And at the same time, I try to have people, and the, many people, falsely believe that they don't speak with an accent, right? There's a, a prevailing stereotype in throughout the country. People, people don't hear their own accents wherever they are. You know, many of the people that you, that sound like Senator Graham in South Carolina would say they don't have an accent. They don't hear their own accent. And they've also had life experiences where um, they haven't been the victim of discrimination based on the way that they, they speak, which in the case of white Southerners would mean that they probably hadn't left that region, right? But um, for those who have experienced discrimination along those lines, I also tell them that you can only do so much in terms of satisfying someone who's likely to be discriminating against you, perhaps for other reasons, and using your language as an excuse for some other reason not to let you have the job 
or rent the apartment. Okay. Thank you. So we have a, another question from Abel Cruz Flores, uh, who asks, uh, how strongly are socioeconomic status and the use of standard English linked according to the linguistic continuum that you showed us? They're often very closely coordinated, but not exclusively so. So we have a lot of examples of very, very wealthy people moving to the United States whose English is limited. Um, I have friends that live in Manhattan and there's been a rush to buy real estate in New York from uh, Arab speakers and speakers of Cantonese from Hong Kong. Their wealth puts them at the very top of the social spectrum, but their English ability is not that strong. Um, I think the question is one where an observation has been made though, that for the most part, when you see um, someone whose linguistic heritage may be very different from English, obtain enough education and enough income, the likelihood that they're more fluent in, in the dominant majority dialect increases. And that trend is one that exists, but uh, it's not uniformly so that, that uh, if someone doesn't speak standard English, they might not be very, very wealthy. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question related to these uh, questions that have already been asked, asking what your thoughts are about how African-American vernacular English or African-American English in particular might be supported in education today. So we can identify how we think a well-educated Southerner or Texan speaks. How does this translate to African-American English speakers? That's a great question. So during the Ebonics controversy, um, I uh, had a, I, what I thought was a great idea and I proposed it to uh, folks at the Department of Education in DC at the time and was very disappointed in their reaction. Um, if you've ever been to Hawaii, you know that many native Hawaiians speak a dialect that they call pidgin, Hawaiian pidgin. And Hawaiian pidgin is a non-standard dialect. And many, many years ago, Senator Inouye was able to procure funding at the Kamehameha School, which is a school that's funded by an endowment from the Bishop Estate that goes all the way back to when Queen Lilani sold a lot of the property to CNH Sugar and Dole Pineapple. And with those billions of dollars, they endowed Kamehameha School, which Native Hawaiians can attend. And it's an it's absolutely wonderful school. And Senator Inouye developed an education program there called the KEEP program, which was the Kamehameha English Education Program. And the Kamehameha English Education Program was intended to help the Hawaiians who were pidgin speakers attending the school gain greater bi-dialectal fluency, right? It didn't denigrate the pidgin, but it was providing them with linguistic tools to be more proficient in standard English. When the Oakland Ebonics controversy broke, one of the motivations of the Oakland School District was to try to procure bilingual education funding. And that was objected to by Richard Riley, who was then the Secretary of Education. And so when I got there, I said, you know, you're right. Oakland doesn't need bilingual education money, but the program in Hawaii might in fact be one that helps African-American students. If you developed a program that had some of the characteristics of the KEEP program in Hawaii, that might be tremendously beneficial to African-Americans. 
And the officials that I spoke to listened carefully and they said, thank you very much. We appreciate your sharing that with us. And three months later, the funding for the program in Hawaii was eliminated. Okay, so um, many educators are loath to address this issue in their schools. They saw what happened in Oakland when the Bonics controversy obtained national attention and the school district was vilified. And so many school superintendents are very reluctant to try to take this on directly. Okay, well. Uh uh, a related question, uh, perhaps more practical, is asking whether there are resources that you would point to for speech language pathologists or educators to draw upon when working to support black and brown children whose families speak dialects other than their own. Can I ask Professor Pena to take that one because that's really her area of expertise, not mine. Um, the, yeah, sure. Um, the American Speech and Hearing Association has done a lot of work and a lot of researchers in this area have done, done a lot of work to, um, to look at differences between children with and without language impairment who use African American English. So, um, work by, um, Julie Washington, who's coming here, um, in January. And um, Janet Edding, um, among other people, have done quite a lot of work to, um, to look at some of these issues. There's a, a test called the DELVE, the DIET, uh, I can't remember what it stands for, um, um, that was um, supported by the National Institutes of Health that also looks at dialect density and then at issues of um, of whether or not children are using or not using certain forms who have and don't have language impairment. So there are definitely efforts. We um, have a long ways to go. It's definitely something that I've been working on for um, bilingual Spanish, English, and for other bilingual pairs. So Greg, I wanna ask a favor. Uh, yes. I'd like to take no more than three or four more questions. So if you could look them over um, oh, yeah. That way we can kind of wrap up by the bottom half of the hour. And um, I bet everybody's really <laughs> ready to have this uh, wrapped up pretty soon. So why don't you uh, take a look and then pick your three or four favorites. Yeah, I think shifting away from uh, practical education questions and, and back toward the language itself, there's a question asking if you could share your thoughts on how African-American vernacular English or Spanish have affected standard or regional dialects of American English. Uh, the person asking the question is thinking not only about the way that uh, African-American vernacular English and various modes of Spanish language are used in US popular culture and marketing, but also in terms of evolving syntactic structures. Right. Well, that sounds like a linguist asking that. But <laughs> um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that um, attitudinal changes toward African-American English and the emergence of rap and hip hop with longevity have really affected the popularity of African-American English. And this is age graded as well. Right. So older Americans, regardless of race, will harbor linguistic stereotypes that are different from younger people. And when I was a child in the 50s, to the extent that you saw whites imitating black speech, it was typically mocking or racist in its intention. Now you see white kids, you know, hanging out at the mall, they got baseball caps on backwards and they're working on their wraps, you know, and it has to do with the popularity of it. Um, to a certain extent, you find some similar things happening with the influence of Spanish as well, kind of K-pop as well, right? Where, where popular culture is, you know, opening um, linguistic horizons that were previously closed, right? So reggaeton uh, is, is having, you know, a stronger linguistic influence. 
In terms of syntactic structures, it's it's much more complicated in some ways. And um, uh, I just want to give um, one quick example. So many African Americans will use the word be in a unique grammatical way. So if they say, you know, she be happy, meaning that she's usually happy all the time, that contrasts with she happy, meaning that she's happy as a momentary state. And that productive interpretation um, can be found with certain other words that linguists have identified and they're called camouflaged forms. And African-American dialect has a few lexical items in English that have a different grammatical function. That has some syntactic impact, but because there's so many non-linguists on the call, I'm not going to go there right now. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, one more question, perhaps a, a quick one here. So uh, you mentioned the linguistic consequences associated with the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Are, is there a chance that you could comment briefly on what those consequences might have looked like? Yeah. So the linguistic isolation of the Japanese population at that particular time um, was a setback, not only economically and occupationally, but their kids were isolated from um, regular schooling and their, their traditional opportunities. One of the things that I uh, admired greatly when I grew up in Los Angeles was that many of my Japanese classmates, after public school was finished and I was walking home, they still went to a Japanese school for another two hours. And that was intended to help them preserve their heritage language and familiarity with Japanese culture. And many Asian American cultures try to have similar educational opportunities that are supplementary to public education in order to preserve um, the, not only the heritage culture and language, but uh, the ability to function in, in both societies. So I'm very much aware of this from the standpoint when I taught at the University of Texas at Austin, we had many graduate students that came from Korea and they fell into one of two categories. Either they were interested in you know, establishing life in the US and not planning to go back to Korea, or they wanted to be able to go back to Korea. The ones that wanted to go back to Korea made sure that their kids maintained Korean, understood the honorifics in the language, and the ones that, you know, were thinking that they were going to establish life in the US, let their kids have what we call subtractive bilingualism and replace the Korean with English and, um, you know, there are differences of opinion as to whether that, that's a good idea or not. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Ba. I think we'll, we'll leave it at that for the questions. And thank you once again for the talk and for engaging with us today. Um, I know that I can speak for my fellow panelists in saying that we're extremely grateful for you taking the time today of all days to to give us that important talk.